My name is Marlo Oaks. I'm the treasurer of the state of Utah, and I talk a lot about ESG because it is very important that all of you understand what this means. Um, and so just by way of background, this is really um, a question of do we want a free market capitalized, capitalist system or do we want uh, a centralized planning? Climate change is really the pretext for pushing this agenda. And the system of ESG is fundamentally agenda-driven, which means it destroys markets. We're talking about co coercion versus freedom. And importantly, I don't address the underlying political issues, such as climate change or uh, social justice. And at the end of the day, ESG is incompatible with our free market system. So if you think about economic freedom, economic freedom is really the, the, um, the reason that we have so much innovation. Uh, we, have, we have an unprecedented history of innovation. If we care about climate, if we care about any issue, we would want our free market capitalist system because we have the best innovation in the world. This is one of my favorite quotes from uh, Founding Father. Crisis is the rallying cry of the tyrant. We hear about crises today, right? Never, never waste one. Never, never waste a, a crisis, that's right. So they tip, typically, the, the most powerful ones are the ones that are global in nature. They're difficult to define, um, and, and really they try to shut down debate around the, the, the crisis itself. So we've seen the global war on terror with the Patriot Act. Actually, you have to give credit to the Democrats for uh, pushing back against the Patriot Act. Uh, COVID-19 with digital IDs and vaccine passports, and then, of course, the climate crisis. So in Chinese, there is a phrase called gai tong apgang. It means a duck and a chicken talking, and that's really what we have going on in the United States today. You have the duck saying, well, ESG is very benign. It's just a, a rating system for investors. They can use this to identify risks. And it appears to work within our free market system. Uh, the chicken, and I would uh, align with the chicken, that says ESG means force. Uh, it, re it really co requires collective action to have impact. There's shareholder activism, which um, in includes engagement with companies, and I'll, I'll show that. Uh, it uses other people's money without their consent. Um, and again, it cannot coexist with free markets. So the first part, the benign part, is this score system. It, it provides a subjective score. These are two different uh, rating companies that are providing uh, ESG ratings on Bank of America here in this case. So one gives it a below average and the other one well above average. Now that's important because anytime you have subjective criteria that is being uh, rated, you should have different outcomes, different ideas about the importance of that subjective criteria. We should not try to converge onto one correct answer uh, on subjective criteria. This is what makes markets work. The only way that you have buying and selling of the same security in any given day is because there's different views about the future. And so we need to be, uh, we need to make sure that, that uh, we don't try to come to one correct answer when it comes to what uh, an ESG score is. The second part is the part that people don't often see. <clears throat> and it's the underlying, uh, well, the, I should say the problem fundamentally with ESG is that it is pushing politics. It's not necessarily the politics itself. It's the fact that it is pushing politics. And you can see this by, uh, this is the first um, use of these three words together in, uh, in literature. And it's a United Nations document from June 2004, Who Cares Wins, only if all actors contribute to the integration of ESG issues and investment decisions can significant improvements in this field be made. Anytime you have an objective or an agenda that, that isn't just making money, you have stepped out of the investment realm and, and you are therefore uh, pushing an agenda that is counter to our economic system. So this is a picture of the cover of this, uh, uh, this publication and these are the uh, the endorsing institutions on the right, I've highlighted the U.S. institutions. Again, this is from June 2004, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. These are all financial institutions. Why? It's because the financial institutions sit at the foundation of our economic system. They're the allocators of capital. It's the banks and the asset managers and others who are deciding who gets capital and who doesn't. And that's where the power is in the marketplace. So as I mentioned, um, 
ESG is incompatible with free markets. Why? Because a free market is one of our most pluralistic institutions. There are a lot of different actors in the marketplace. And if one decides that uh, a certain project is too risky, another will step in and, and provide that capital. That is the beauty of our capital system. Uh, and, and the challenge is, is how do you capture that system? It's very difficult to capture such a pluralistic institution as our markets, but it is happening through ESG. And I'll show a little bit more on this. But let's first talk about the benefits of our economic system. And I've highlighted the one in the middle here. It supports individual and societal freedoms. We, as consumers, are really at the heart of our economic system. It's very similar to the Constitution, that each of us are sovereign beings, that we, we are the ones that uh, decide who, are, who governs us. We decide how we are going to spend our money. And companies are trying to satisfy our demands. Uh, and, and so um, it's, it's very much uh, consumer centric. The system under ESG is almost exactly the opposite. You have less innovation, less wealth, um, it's less efficient. Uh, we're seeing that with electronic, uh, electric vehicles sitting on uh, car lots, right? Because the government has decided that car manufacturers have to create um, uh, and build electric vehicles. Uh, Solyndra putting 600 million into a solar company, I mean, these inefficiencies uh, literally lead to then a national security problem because you do not have the wealth that you had under a capitalist system. So who do the companies serve? Bud Light and Target are examples of what happens when we have top-down control. And in this case, it's Human Rights Campaign. The Human Rights Campaign is a, an organization that creates the Corporate Equality Index. And in order to get a perfect score, and this is what companies are trying to do, is get a perfect score, some of our largest companies, they have to offer healthcare benefits which cover gender reassignment surgeries for employees and dependents. This changes every year, by the way, so this is in 2023. Uh, the other thing they had to do is uh, conduct a Bud Light style marketing campaign, in other, in other words, featuring somebody from the LGBT LGBTQ plus, uh, the uh, exactly, uh, um, either uh, feature them or target that um, segment of, the, of society have a product line crafted to those customers. So you can see what's happening in the marketplace that doesn't make sense if you're thinking about a free market system, but this has changed now. We are suddenly moving away from the consumer as the, as the main uh, entity in the market to other organizations that are dictating the behavior of companies that doesn't make sense economically. So what is the agenda behind ESG? This is really the central agenda behind ESG. This is from the Washington Post magazine. This is back in 2019 when the chief of staff of AOC said the Green New Deal, which was another push to, for net zero, said that the Green New Deal wasn't originally about the uh, climate. It was about how do you change the economic system. In, uh, in 2015, Figueres, this is a woman at the UN. She's the head of the climate uh, initiative at the UN back in 2015. She was working on the Paris Climate Agreement. And she said, this is the first time in world history that we have tried to change, intentionally change, the economic system that's been in place in the world for the last 150 years. Why is somebody who is over climate talking about changing an economic system? This is the underlying pretext of or this is the underlying agenda that climate is the pretext for. So uh, we cannot fight climate change with capitalism, says report. That was a report that the, was for the UN. Uh, the world economies are totally unprepared for rapid climate change and addressing social inequality. <laughs> well, what system is going to address those? Of course, they don't tell us that. <laughs> so we're going to get rid of capitalism and move to what? Um, BlackRock, this is Larry Fink's letter to CEOs back in 2020, uh, one of the most influential letters that didn't come out this year, I believe, thankfully. Uh, a fundamental reshaping of finance. What does Larry mean by that? Well, every government, company, and shareholder must confront climate change. So we're going to do that by changing finance. All right, so 
let's let's dive a little deeper into the banks and the asset managers. What's happening in those um, sectors? So, these are the net zero climate pledges. This is the financial sector. These different green dots here, and I've highlighted the net zero banking alliance. But over on the left, you have asset owners. The asset owners, like their pension systems, the sovereign wealth funds. These are the massive pools of capital that are going out and deciding which asset managers to, to, uh, to hire to, to manage assets. Uh, but then you have the banks that have um, signed on to the net zero and made net zero climate pledges. So globally, this rep these banks represent over 40% of banking assets in the world. In the United States, 50% uh, of banking assets in the world. I mean, a tremendous consolidation of power with our top six uh, financial institutions there that have signed on to uh, the uh, Net Banking Alliance, and basically what they're doing is, is trying to, or committing to uh, cut lending to different segments of the economy. Um, so these are the dig different segments here. I've, I've highlighted agriculture. Basically the orange line is the baseline greenhouse gas emissions. The blue are the targets that they're supposed to work towards. Um, and, and these banks have, have uh, when they sign on to the Net Zero Banking Alliance, they're told we need three sectors that you want to target initially, and then you have 36 months to, to uh, give targets for the other nine or other six seg sectors. So agriculture, look at that. We're talking about how are they going to do that? Okay, that's, that's going to affect everybody. Um, so... Let's look at J.P. Morgan Chase. These are their initial three uh, segments that they've targeted, electric power, oil and gas, auto manufacturing. Now, this is, this is an unbelievable quote here. This is Jamie Dimon, head of uh, J.P. Morgan, who said, there must be collective ambition and cooperation by business and government to tackle climate change. Well, that brings to mind a certain Italian dictator back in the 1930s who said fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it is a merger of state and corporate power. Um, then in December of 2022, so that was those three segments that they initially highlighted was from 2021. This is December 2022, so not even 12 months ago. JP Morgan came out with three more segments that they're targeting, uh, aviation being one of them. Um, so here are the implications for transportation, net zero transportation. 80% reduction of emissions in transport by reducing passenger aviation demand. Well, how are they going to do that? Well, they want us to stop flying or uh, to pay a green premium. Basically, there's a push to reduce regional flights. Um, so those are flights that are less than an hour and build high-speed rail to push people into rail off of uh, airlines, that is a economic <laughs> boondoggle. Uh, California has been working on high-speed rail and it is just unbelievable, the price tag there. Um, and so also introducing, or sorry, reducing international flights. Um, there's also something called smart cities. So smart cities keep people confined, right? Um, that'll reduce travel, <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> so. A lovely plan, don't you think? All these central planners, it's amazing what great ideas they have. Um, all right, agriculture. Global food system represents 25 to 35 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, you can see the bottom two segments. Uh, land use change, which is basically taking uh, what was forests and turning it into farmland. Uh, that's land, land use change. But then agricultural production. So this is talking really about nitric nitrix os, sorry nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer use and methane emissions from livestock and rice i bet you didn't know methane came out of rice uh, but it does apparently so what's the solution cut red meat consumption by 50 percent uh, and there's the potential for 34 million direct jobs uh, globally that could be lost um, in livestock and feed related jobs by 2050. Um, we have a case study of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka uh, replaced nitrogen fertilizer back in 2021. Uh, in 2022, rice production fell by 40% and prices increased 80%. That was a recipe for a complete disaster. Thank you, central planning. All right, so <laughs> this is an email. Uh, that uh, client is a client of uh, Credit Suisse who had given them a lot of business over the years. Credit Suisse is one of the major, was one of the major investment banks, they're no longer. Um, 
but they, this uh, client had a company that he wanted to take public, and, and uh, the bank came to him and said, well, we don't like the tweets that you have out on social media. They're pro oil and gas, and uh, you've questioned climate change. So if you want us, you know, we really want to work together. So in order to work together, we need you to tweet out four things, uh, and then, and then uh, that should pass our sustainability committee. So here they are. Uh, agree that the company activities should be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Uh, you, you believe that companies should have a commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. You agree that climate change is occurring and that carbon is contributing to climate change and global warming. And you believe that man is contributing to the addition of carbon in the atmosphere. If you don't believe those, we don't care. You just have to lie. Uh, another thing that's happening, debanking. So uh, if you have the wrong um, political views or, or uh, religious views or are religious at all, in some cases, I guess, uh, you will uh, lose your banking privileges. This is very dangerous, folks. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move to the Asset Managers Initiative, Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. So work... This is what they commit to, to work in partnership with asset owner clients. So those are the ones, those are the pension systems that are hiring them as investment managers. So think BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. Those are the three major asset managers here in the United States that, that uh, are passive managers. They're just buying an index. Uh, so these are, they're, uh, everyone except for Vanguard, Vanguard got away from the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, which was a great thing. Um, but clearly there is collusion here because they're working in these groups uh, to, to push an agenda that, other than to make money. Uh, this is the principles for responsible investment from the United Nations. These are the, the things that you commit to uh, as an investment manager, um, basically integrating ESG into your investment analysis. Uh, you're going to be active owners that incorporate ESG. This is very important because the passive investment managers are committing to be active owners. There's a huge disconnect here. Um, and then uh, working to, uh, to force disclosures on ESG uh, issues. And then promoting the acceptance of ESG. You know, it's just, it's, it's one big group that is trying to push an agenda through the marketplace. So this is an example of market engagement. What does this look like? So BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, this is in the case, in this case, BlackRock engaging with ExxonMobil, saying you need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You need to create a plan to be net zero by 2050. And oh, by the way, you need to cut oil production by 20%. Now, who does that affect in the marketplace? It's not just... It's not just the shareholders of, of BlackRock, it's everybody in the marketplace and everybody that, whether you own ExxonMobil or not. We are paying the price for this today. Um, and so the enforcement mechanism is not voting for the boards of director, members of the board of director who are not sufficiently committed to the agenda. So that's a very important element that most people don't see. This vote happens every year uh, every company has an a, um, annual meeting, and that's where they vote for uh, the board of director and some of these other elements. And so um, these major investors are not backing certain uh, members of the board if they're not uh, sufficiently committed. So this is a, a huge problem. If you don't allow alternative viewpoints, you don't have a market, and frankly, you don't have a free society. Now, this is, a, this is evidence of... Um, BlackRock and these other organizations that have taken other people's money, they don't realize that, that their index products, they're not labeled ESG. They don't have to be labeled ESG if they say ESG risk is investment risk. Therefore, we can use everybody's assets to push this agenda because ESG risk is an investment risk. So this was an a opinion piece that I did in the Wall Street Journal back in May talking about the historic breach of fiduciary duty in the United States. All right, so what kind of system? There's a test for us all. Uh, allows people to have their opinion only if it is the right opinion. Is based on repeating one narrative regardless of other information that might refute it. Uh, silences alternative viewpoints. Punishes those who do not go along with the narrative until they agree with the acceptable truth. <laughs> punishes people for their religious beliefs. 
Well, Edward, Edward Murrow said, uh, the right of dissent, or if you prefer, the right to be wrong, is surely fundamental to the existence of a democratic society. That's the right that went first in every nation that stumbled down the trail toward totalitarianism. ESG looks compatible with the free market, but it is not. <laughs> It masquerades as an investment rating system, and its proponents say it's just more information, but it really seeks to replace the free market system. We either have the economic system that ESG ushers in, or we have our market-based system. We can't have both. And the market is not easily going to solve this problem. These are bank charters on the left that have, have uh, been uh, new bank charters that have been approved by the FDIC. You can see uh, very few since 2009. Um, from 1990 to 2008, there were over 2,000 bank applications that were approved. Since 2008, or since, yeah, 2009 basically to the present, there's been about 60, something like that. Um, so, huge problem. Uh, the one on the right, this shows uh, investment in oil and gas funds in North America among asset owners, the big pension systems. We went from 50 billion in 2015 down to three in 2021. The only way you get that is if there's an agenda being pushed in the marketplace. It's unprecedented. And who does this harm? Well, unfortunately, low-income households spend three times more of their income on energy. Uh, in, in 2020, minority groups represent nearly half of all households living with energy insecurity. Uh, on the right is this lawsuit in California, um, the 200, which is a, civil, a, a coalition of founders of civil rights organizations, community and business leaders, housing advocates, former state legislators and cabinet members um, suing the California Air Resources Board for their climate policies. Because, why? Because it harms those who can least afford it, these minority groups and low income. It's very sinister. So what can we do? We need to have businesses hear from us. If, if you have uh, companies that you know are politicizing their business, Target and Bud Light, this is really important that we as the marketplace send a message to these companies that you're going to pay a price by politicizing your business. This is a, this, I can't stress how important this is. We need to stop doing business with them, but importantly, we also need to tell them why we're stopping doing business with them. And conversely, if companies are not politicizing their business, let them know you appreciate that. Companies are in the business to provide a good or service that at a reasonable price that attracts customers. That is the social good of business. And business has been under, under attack for decades. And now we hear things like we have to give back as if companies have stolen things from, from the market, right? Uh, companies, the goods and services they provide are important for all of us and that helps to uh, lift the standard of living for all of us. With your investment dollars, ask your financial advisor or plan representative, have I invested in any funds that voted my shares in favor of racial equity audits, emissions reduction plans, executive compensation tied to ESG goals? Have I invested in any funds that systematically underweight companies in any of the following industries? So coal, mining, uh, oil and gas exploration, defense or firearms. If, uh, if yes, then ask them to please find an alternative investment management company that isn't doing that. You'll be amazed at how important your voice is in the marketplace if you have a retirement that you're with, some company that you're with, talk to that or, or your husband or, or whomever. Make sure that they are talking to the, that, the company that sponsors the plan to get the, the answers to these questions. As soon as they figure out that the, the marketplace is onto them, it's going to change. And it is changing. We are seeing some changes. But some, you know, this last um, uh, proxy season, there were headlines that BlackRock and Vanguard had not supported nearly as many ESG uh, propo uh, proposals at companies. The reality is, is if you, so I think the number was like 7% for BlackRock. So these votes are very important, those racial equity audits and, and um, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the, the report said only BlackRock supported 7%. If you adjust it for the engagement that they did, 
and they said, we, engaged, we didn't vote for this because, that's my timer, sorry. Uh, we didn't vote for this because we engaged with the company and they're already implementing it. So if you adjust those numbers, it's actually 56%. BlackRock was supportive of 56% of, of the proposal. So uh, it's not what they say it is. Anyway, I will uh, pause there and take questions. Yes.